Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. Hi, welcome back to Truth Be Told, Living with MS. I'm Marie Heron, your host. I want to thank all of you for the feedback and the comments and the questions after our first podcast. I'm glad we had so many followers. Um, I'm so excited because uh, in studio today we have Juan Garita, who is the national co- or coordinator of national programs and services with the MS Society of Canada. I sat down with Juan a couple of weeks ago, and I just love his story, and I'm so happy that he's here today uh, to share it with us. So welcome, Juan. Hi. How are you doing? Did you Good. have any trouble finding us? Uh, no, perfect. Uber <laughs> is great at that. So. Uber, great. Okay, so plug in for Uber, great. Um, I know when you and I first met, um, we talked about uh, your diagnosis journey, and I have to tell you that one of the questions that I was asked the most, um, people had emailed me and they said they knew our di- my diagnosis, which seemed to them tremendously quick uh, because, you know, as you know from my story, it was a weekend. You know, I went in on the Thursday night and I knew by Monday that I had MS. And we know that not everybody is like that. Um, so I'm wondering if you could please uh, talk about your uh, diagnosis journey and how old you were and how that played out. Definitely. So right now I am 24 years old Mm -hmm. and I was diagnosed when I had first turned 19. Okay. Um, And so that summer I was living in Quebec doing an exchange to learn French. And on the way back from Quebec, on the way to Toronto, I woke up in Montreal on the train and I couldn't feel the bottom half of my body. My legs had gone completely numb. Okay. And you were on the train. I was on the train. And so I had thought that I had slept weird on the train i had slipped a disc pinched a nerve something like that i Mm -hmm. figured it would go away um but then two days later it still hadn't and so my mom took me to the emergency room actually and they didn't really find anything and it took you know six hours it wasn't life-threatening so we were there for a while so they said go home and see if you feel better in the morning okay so uh, so so sorry to interrupt but so you're 19 years old and you're on the train and and you know you you, you what lost lost use of the bottom of your body mm-hmm. okay and so how did you get from the train to or did your mom pick you up yeah so she po- picked me up in toronto so i was able mm-hmm. to still walk i just couldn't feel it was right. just oh, I it see. felt like they had fallen asleep okay um but the entire bottom half of my body as opposed to just my leg or my foot. Okay, all right. So you got to emerge and they just... They did a couple tests on me. They said, this is probably an anomaly. Just go home and you'll be fine. Or see how you feel in the morning. And in the morning, we still didn't feel. I still didn't feel great. So we went to a walk-in clinic, actually, because I didn't have a family doctor at the time. Okay. So we went into a walk-in clinic and... The walk-in clinic doctor said, I want to send you for an MRI, actually, um, that I'm surprised the ER didn't do that. So he wrote me up the requisition for an MRI, and we went to the hospital, got the MRI, and he said, come back and see me with the MRI results. And this is the walk-in clinic? This is the walk-in clinic. Okay. And so we couldn't even make an appointment with him once the MRI, they called us and said, your MRI has been sent to the doctor. So we just had to go, and we waited for... We just had to hope that he was able to see us that day quickly. And so once we were able to go in, we waited in the waiting room like anyone else. Uh, We went in and he said, I'm pretty sure you have MS. I'm not a neurologist. I can't officially diagnose you. But based on my past experiences with patients with MS and seeing your MRI, I'm pretty sure you have it. So luckily, I do know one of the neurologists in Toronto Mm -hmm. at St. Michael's Hospital. And so I'm going to refer you to him. And then... He should be able to help you out a little bit more. And uh, Okay, so a couple of things I wanted to ask you. So they said to you, you know, it looks like you have MS. Okay, did you know what MS was and, you know, like how, how did you feel about that? I had no idea what MS okay. was. I had heard about MS. Mm-hmm. I had seen it in the news. 
the MS Readathon in school. Mm -hmm. I'd probably seen the A&W ads before, but I had never really paid attention to it because it didn't really affect me at all. Right. Okay. So, so, and how was your mom when, when you told her? She was also scared. Like, our, mm-hmm. everyone in my family was just wondering exactly what it was. Um, my mom, as mothers do, tried to stay strong and mm-hmm. uh, tried to be the strength of our family. But I have a feeling it was a lot harder for her than she showed off. Oh, pro- yeah, absolutely. I can definitely relate to that. When I first met you, um, we had coffee, and I was really impressed with your commitment to positivity. You, you told me your story then, and I was so impressed because we were talking about, um, you know, how attitude can, you know, influence your disease. Um, can you share with our listeners um, how you maintain this, this, this positive outlook? Definitely. I, I've always been an optimistic person. I've always been kind of happy-go-lucky. And ha- being diagnosed with MS didn't change that. Mm-hmm. It just changed how much importance and how intentional I was with that optimism. And I find that um, with optimism, it's often misconstrued as naivete or as not knowing the real world. When, in fact, it's a very valid point of view and attitude to carry through life. And Angela Duckworth, who wrote a book on grit and resilience, has mm-hmm. this concept of active hope. Oh, okay. In- as, instead of passive hope, where it's, I hope things get better. Active hope is, I'm going to work to make things better. Okay. So it's about ensuring that you are doing everything you can to make things better. Active optimism isn't about thinking everything's going to be perfect 100% of the time. It's about looking at a situation and either if it's great, making sure it stays great, Mm -hmm. or if it's not perfect, or if it's a bad situation, figuring out how you can either make it great or changing your attitude about it. One of my favorite quotes is from Maya Angelou, and it's, uh, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Okay. And that's what I do in life. It's if I'm in a situation that I'm not happy with, how can I make it better? How can I improve this community? How can I take a role? How can I, you know, make a new initiative, start a new group? What can I do to make this situation or this community better? And if I'm not able to make those changes, then it's, why am I not happy in this situation? Am I feeling like I'm being more judgmental than usual? Am I looking at people in a different way that I shouldn't be doing? So it's all about that attitude change for me. Um, if I am not able to just change it or you know work and make it better myself. I, I know, again, you and I talked about and I said to you that um, my, my attitude with my MS, and again, it is as we've discussed, um, it's very different for, for everyone. Um, but I always thought that, you know, if you if you really set your mind uh, to something, and although, you know, medical, um, you know, professionals might disagree with me, um, but I do think that there is a lot to be said uh, for sort of willing things to, to, you know, come true, and you can sort of modify uh, which way your, your, your destiny is going to be. Um, we, you and I, when we were discussing, we both experienced rapid successions of flare-up post-diagnosis. I know that I had lost my balance after I was uh, diagnosed. I know that um, I uh, had lost my sight again after I was diagnosed. And so I think those rapid successions for me at the time uh, led me to believe, and I think it would lead anyone to believe, that their disease is really rapidly deteriorating and they uh, they have a progressive MS, which we know isn't true. I mean, that's just the stress of of diagnosis um did you have that happen to you yeah it did when i was after i was diagnosed and i after i had seen my neurologist uh because i was young because we had caught it early and i'd only had that one and there was another incident a couple years earlier that Mm -hmm. may or may not be related to ms we don't ever will know um and so my doctor my neurologist said i want to start you on treatment right away you're at a stage where you don't need the treatment, mm-hmm. but if we start the treatment now, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, nip it in the bud, basically, mm-hmm. and delay it as much as possible. And so we started treatment, but he had warned us that it was a treatment that would cause it to get worse before it got better. Something about how it changes the chemical makeup of my body, I'm not mm-hmm. a scientist, um, would force it to progress faster, to th- throw me into a flare-up. So I'd started my treatment, and two months Two months in, I woke up one day, again, not feeling the bottom half of my body, 
but also feeling nauseous, feeling disoriented. Uh, the only the best way I can explain it is it was as if I was very very drunk as soon as I woke up. I couldn't balance. I I was throwing up. I couldn't keep any food down. Um, I couldn't even walk in a straight line, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was uh, that was very scary because I didn't know what was happening. Right. And because it was still so new, I didn't instantly think of it as oh this is MS. I I assumed this was something a lot worse, and so we that continued on for two weeks uh, in December, and so I spent actually. Uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, four hours each in the hospital getting steroids pumped right, into me right. in order to, you know, get me out of there. And so it just ended up going away. And luckily for me, and, uh, you know, I'll preface everything I said about optimism and yeah. my outlook was saying that I haven't had a flare up in five years now. And that's not just because of my optimistic, positive attitude. I've been listening to my doctor and keeping my treatments. I've changed my diet. I've changed my, uh, you know, activity level. And I've really started to manage my stress because it was so scary having to go through that flare up that I want to do everything I can to avoid that. Right. Or, you know, my thought process is if I can make sure my body is strong, my mind is strong and I'm healthy, then when I do experience a flare up, the drop will not be as severe. Right. That's my hope. Right. Well, you know, again, um, I guess everybody would have, would have loved to have been with us when we had coffee because we discussed so much. Um, I believe that, and I think you do too, that there are certain things that we have in our control uh, that are disease modifying. Um, one of them, I believe, is um, exercise. And you were talking about you have a an exercise regime or, that you follow. There's no really specific regime. It's just I want to try to make sure I'm as active as possible. Just that knowing that I'm comfortable running a certain amount or that I'm comfortable using my legs and Mm -hmm. ensuring that I'm keeping all the, you know, up, then that's that's what's key to me because I've always, as many people have, have gone in and out of being very active to being not active at all, being very healthy to being Mm -hmm. not very healthy at all. And so I've gone through that as anyone will through especially through teenage years and as a young adult. But when, uh, you know, this year I really started to think about exercise and health a lot differently. Mm -hmm. Even though it's now five years into my diagnosis, I finally started to realize it's not about looking like Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It's not about looking like Ricky Martin. It's about me being able to use my body how I want to use it. Because I realize I'm not ever probably going to be an Olympic marathon runner, so I don't need to train like mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. I need to train like someone who works in an office 9 to 5, likes to go dancing, and likes to go on long walks. That's who I need to be exercising mm-hmm. for, so that way I can use my body in that way. Because mm-hmm. that's what I'm using it for. I'm not using it to lift my body weight times two. I'm using it to you know play with my four year old niece and be able to lift her up and lift her, be able to play with which, her which in turn um you know inspires good thoughts and good feelings which it, it's all cumulative exactly you know it's all cumulative and um it's interesting because um, when i was diagnosed all those years ago they you know poo-pooed exercise um you know they said that exercise uh you know you would get stressed and you would be tired and it would b- build on fatigue but later on um i found that uh, by exercising i actually had more energy mm-hmm. and i think there's start i think that uh neurologists and doctors agree that exercise is definitely a, a really good way to yeah. go and i find that a lot of it is listening to your body so some days i'll head into the gym and i'll have so much energy i'll have so much strength so i'll go run half an hour on the treadmill and then i'll go do weights and then i'll go do a dance class and there are some days i'll show up to the gym as and i think i'll do the same thing again i'll do the weights and the running and the dance class and i walk in i'm like oh man i'm gonna do a light jog on the treadmill for 20 minutes and then i'm gonna go stretch yeah that's what my body needs today and that's what i can do so i'm i'm not gonna push the limits too much because i don't want to one, I don't want to hurt myself, but I also don't know exactly what will happen if I push my limits too far and physically stress my body too much because I don't want to throw myself into a flare up. And so just listening to your body. And so some days I'll just go in for yoga. And especially with yoga, they say, you're doing yoga for you right now. So do what you need to do. If you need to modify it, if you need to sit and move out, do it. Listen to your body. And I've taken that with every part of exercise for me. You know what I'm, what I'm taking from this one is that, you know, 
it's not just for people with MS. I mean, this is for, for people who don't have MS. I mean, if you're working out, it's like listen to your body. Um, but especially, you know, when you have MS, it's, yeah, it's not about knowing your limitations. Your body will tell you. Um, and like anybody with or without MS, you'd be foolish not to. And, you know, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, it's interesting that this is a podcast and nobody can see you, but, you know, you're talking about dancing and running and they're probably thinking, oh, God, Marie's so lucky she's got this super hunk in the uh, in the." Are you saying I'm not a super hunk? I, I, no, I'm saying you are. I'm just saying it's a shame that people can't see you. <laughs> Yeah, wait till we get our next guest on. She'll tell you. <laughs> She'll tell us what a super hunk you are. Um, you know, you, uh, Jack Osborne um, has MS. And I've been doing a little bit of research. I've been trying to reach out and get him on the podcast, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Jack Osborne has MS, and he has said uh, that he believes there's a silver lining in ha- having MS. Um, I know what the positive aspect was for myself. Uh, two questions. Would you agree with Jack Osborne and ha- MS, there is a silver lining? And two, uh, what would you say the silver lining is for you? It kind of goes back to the question that we were talking about before. I don't think inherently MS has a silver lining, but I've found one. I, I looked at the situation I'm in and I thought, this. I can't let this be all bad. I can't let this ruin my life forever because I have a lot of my life left and I there, there's a lot that I want to accomplish so so I can't let the weigh this down and so I've been able to find situations mm-hmm. where I can find that silver lining so for example I found an amazing community through starting to volunteer for the MS Society and now working for them I'm surrounded by you know hundreds of people with MS who are living full active valid lives and who are accomplishing so much either for themselves for their own local communities or for the MS community and that's been so inspiring and it's helped me find and really appreciate the people in my life whether they're part of the MS community or they're my family and friends and seeing how much love and support people are willing to give and that's been my silver lining of it's really taught me the value and the power of gratitude and mm-hmm. the power of community. Great. That's, you know, I, I just, I love everything about your story, Juan. I really do. And I, I love that message that you just got out. Um, what would you say, uh, if you had one thing to say to somebody who was a newly diagnosed one young person, and you know, that one of the reasons I started this was because I said, you know, when I was 24 and I was first diagnosed, I would want to see someone who, you know, was living a full life. And, um, you know, that's what Truth Be Told is, is about because too many people look up on the internet and they hear horrible, horrible things. Um, and, you know, you talking about all the people that you know and who have MS who are living full lives. And I really want uh, the people listening to, to understand that. Um, I guess I want to ask you, um, I know when I was diagnosed, I I had, I was working temp and I had a temp assignment at the MS Society, um, but I didn't go to, to groups and support groups because I was scared of what I was going to see. But you're working for the MS Society. How did that come about? So I started volunteering work for them about a year after my diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And that was super important for me because when I was first diagnosed, my na- my neurologist actually told me not to tell many people because there's a stigma attached to MS and to disability, and he didn't want to affect my work or my, mm-hmm. um, you know, my career prospects because I had just started university, so at the, you know, pre-beginning of my career, so he didn't want to affect that, and especially with friends and social groups, it's not always an easy thing to talk about or to deal with, especially if someone's not dealing with it properly themselves yet. Mm-hmm. Um, But I am a big extrovert. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. If I'm having a great day, you're going to know it. If I'm having a bad day, everyone's going to know it. And so not being able to tell people and not, you know, reaching out to folks except for, you know, my family and maybe a couple close friends, that was super hard for me. I am a big believer in storytelling, and I wasn't able to tell my true valid story and I was a leader of my student community but there was this part of myself that I wasn't able to be authentic about oh, okay and so about a year after my diagnosis I just said I have had enough I need to tell people I want to share my story and I had seen on the MS Society website that we were looking they were looking for youth blo- youth blogger
years Mm -hmm. for their Mm -hmm. youth blog. And I had been blogging for my school that whole year. And I thought this is something I like doing. This will allow me to reach out. And it's low commitment, too. It's not, you know, I'm not leading a whole new group. I'm not developing a whole new treatment. I'm just being able to share my story. And so I started with that. And that led me to a lot of other great opportunities. Uh, There's a video series we did about youth with MS. Um, I did, um, you know, I went to different conferences as Mm -hmm. a volunteer and uh, to give my opinion. Uh, And last year, actually, I was uh, the A&W Inspirational Ambassador for their A&W MS campaign. And so I was actually able to fly across the country. I know, I'm so, a- <laughs> I'm so jealous. I am so jealous. <laughs> it was an incredible opportunity uh, because I went to uh, almost every single province mm-hmm. uh, and I was able to meet people at different A&W restaurants who were putting their heart and soul into these fundraisers. And these restaurants that we went to were the restaurants who had the highest growth in donations the year before. And you could see why. It wasn't just buy the team burger there were restaurants that were having silent auctions at the same time and had performers and buskers and they were putting so much energy into putting this um these fundraisers on uh specifically for the ms society and for people with ms and so being able to go in person and speak uh on my behalf but also hopefully on the behalf of so many other people that are grateful for the amount of work they're putting into it was incredible and that's what i talk about when i say the love and the power of community because now i know there are people in cranbrook bc which is a small town in the middle of the mountains in bc fighting for ms even if it's just a couple days a year that they're going and they're you know bringing the entire town to go get burgers um but there's also people out in st john's and mount pearl literally coast to coast i know there are people that are fighting for ms a lot of people don't know that you know, MS is Canada's disease. There's 150,000 people in Canada with MS. Um, and as you know, originally, um, they always said MS was a Northern European disease. Um, you're from Guatemala. You were born in Guatemala. Um, so I just want to ask you, what does MS look like across the country? Do you find that the, that the MS, uh, the people with MS are as diverse as Canada itself now? Definitely, it really okay. is. Um, and, it, it, you know, there is the prevalence of MS uh, in Canada, and there's, you know, environmental factors mm-hmm. or whatever it is that's making us have a higher prevalence of it anyway. But especially since starting to work at the MS Society, mm-hmm. so having started to work this year and going into a role of someone who I worked with when I was a volunteer, and that's what made me mm-hmm. drawn to this uh, to this position, was I know who did this, and I know what they did. I want to do that now. And so right. it was open, so I applied for it and started working there. But especially working there this year, I've really learned that part of it is also, because we have such a high prevalence, our doctors are looking for it. It's, you know, MS is often diagnosed by elimination. And so it's one of the first things doctors are looking at. And a lot of other chronic illnesses are. So, you mm-hmm. know, if someone comes in presenting symptoms, which with MS, as you know, are, is a mixed bag, it can be anything from vertigo to numbness to cognitive issues. So if someone goes in, they're like, let's check if it's MS because we know we have a high rate of it. Mm-hmm. So let's see if it's that. So we have people looking for it. So we're diagnosing it more, which is great. But also, Canada has amazing research happening at their universities across the country. The MS clinics are every day finding new breakthroughs and new treatments and new, uh, you know, and these researchers are, because of the nature of medical research, they get so niche. Mm -hmm. They're like, let's look at how vitamin D affects this specific cell in people with relapsing remitting MS. And every day they're finding new things out, which is amazing. Yeah. I just, I just want to share again, this fabulous copy you and I had. Um, Juan, you did say um, that you took vitamin D, which I I had read. I mean, read so many things about people with MS should take vitamin D and I, I hadn't been, um, and I've started to, um, but uh, it's because of the lack of, of sunshine that we have in Canada that they, is that right? Is that why they? Yeah, so that's what they say. And uh, because of that, I've read, I'm not a doctor. I'm yeah, not we're a not doctors. We don't even play um, them on TV. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they say that Canadians across the country probably have chronic vitamin D deficiency mm-hmm. just because of how much sunlight we have. Um, don't, you know, or don't have. Or don't have, exactly. <laughs> lack thereof. Um, and so everyone could stand from probably getting a little extra vitamin yeah. D, whether it's from their diet or whether it's from supplements. Um, but there have been studies and there is links between vitamin D deficiency and MS. And I know at least for myself, uh, when I was first diagnosed, uh, 
besides the major flare-ups that I had, you know, mm-hmm. once every couple of days, maybe a couple times a day, my arm would just go, you know, kind of tingly, kind right. of a little yeah. numb for yeah. about 10, 15 minutes. Just nothing worrisome. I could probably still write. I could throw a ball. It was just, it's a little tingly right now. And before I started my uh, my first medication, my doctor had said, take some extra vitamin D. And I started taking it, and almost instantly, those tiny, mm-hmm. tingly flare-ups went away. Right, right. They went completely away. And, you know, five years now, I haven't felt them, really. And so I've continued to take the vitamin D just because I've seen literally the effects that it has for me. Right. And I, I listen to my doctor, and... You know, a lot of people might be, you know, hesitant about listening to doctors or the medical industry. And I think it's really about finding what the care system that works for you. And for me, it's a mix of listening to my doctor and changing my health and changing my activity. Um, And that's my care system and that's my approach to my disease. And it's going to be different for everyone else. It's just find what you're comfortable with because that's going to be important if i wasn't comfortable doing xyz then that's not going to be healthy for me mentally or spiritually um because it might you know help me physically but i'm going to hate myself every time i do that specific treatment um because that's what i have to do and that's what i'm supposed to do so it's about finding what you're comfortable with and what works it's that fine balance so you, I, I take it you agree with me because that you know everybody's MS is their MS, and this is you know what this podcast is about. It's living with MS and living with your MS, and I've loved um, you know everything that you've shared uh, today. I think you've, you've you've given nothing but hope and uh, inspiration and and direction to people. And uh, um, one of the things, the last things I I think I'd like to ask you is. Uh, you know, one with everything else you've said, this might be redundant. Uh, but if you had one thing to say uh, to a newly diagnosed young person, what would it be? Working in uh, you know the health industry or health charities, people often talk about find your care team, and that's a mix of doctors and you know your caregivers and anything else. And I like to expand that to just find your community find your MS community. So that's, for me, that's a mix of my neurologist, my family doctor, my family friends, and my gym partners, and, you know, everyone else that just helps me get through MS every single day. And so it's finding, as I said, finding the treatment options that you're comfortable with and work, but it's also about finding the people that you can surround yourself by to help you out on those hard days Mm -hmm. or to make those great days even better. And so you can't do this alone. And there, as we said, there are hundreds of thousands of Canadians who have MS. And because of that, there are millions of Canadians affected by MS because their loved ones and their friends and their families have MS. And so it's not something that you have to do alone. Right. And so don't do it alone. Fine. And, I, you know, as I said, I'm an extrovert. So I'm completely fine flying across the country, speaking to strangers and going on podcasts and writing blogs about my MS. But that's because I wear my emotions on my sleeve. This is how I process my emotions. This podcast is another step for me to deal with my MS. Mm-hmm. Other people are introverts. And maybe you just want to find a journal and just, you know, a couple friends you want to confide in about your MS. That is completely fine. That is completely valid find what works for you in terms of medicine, in terms of treatment, in terms of symptom management, in terms of attitude management, really. And on that note, um, before we say goodbye to Juan, I want to say to everyone who's listening that we do want to hear your stories. And, you know, I can be reached at marie at truthbetold.ca. Send me your questions, send me your comments. But please, if you'd like to be on the podcast, we can have you phone in or we can have you in studio. Um, You'll get to meet the really charming Phil. Um, And thank you so much for listening. Again, this is Marie Heron, Living with MS, Truth Be Told. 